Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 133 of the Effort Report. Uh, this is pandemic episode 21. I'm Elizabeth Matsui. I'm here with Roger Pang. Did I get those episode numbers right? I mean, I think there's a high chance. There's a high chance. We're, we're just throwing in the towel. <laughs> <laughs> just now? I thought it was... Just now? <laughs> We can't count. It's definitely 133. The question okay. is, how many pandemic episodes have we done? <laughs> and there's been a bit of a gap. Yes, there has. Maybe. So there's a bit of a backstory to the gap. I mean, one was that I actually went on a vacation. Um, and two, although this is a, and that ended up being a smaller delay, is, um, as you know, I'm based in Texas. And when I was coming back to Austin from a vacation to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary um, was when the storm hit Texas. And so as close as I could get to Austin was Houston. Um, so I, I was in a hotel in Houston with intermittent power, eating candy bars and chips until yesterday. I, I should say that you did offer to you know, to dial in on your phone and, you know, podcast the uh, old fashioned way, so to speak. <laughs> I did. I did. And you, I, I said, you know, maybe we need a gritty episode and you kind of, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't bite really. <laughs> I thought, uh, I thought it was asking a little bit too much of my podcast co-host. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you, even though like, you know, we had intermittent power, so I was under a pile of blankets in the bed, and there was food and water that um, it was kind of mentally taxing. So it could have made for, I don't know, it could have made for a great episode. Or a scary one. Exactly. So anyway, so we've had a delay, and um, hopefully this will, I'm looking or, or looking at you, Roger, for our technical editor for getting it all edited up and pushed out. <laughs> I think we'll be in good shape. Once again, we have no title. I think we've we given up on titles, right? Right. You make them up after you. We've given up on organization in general, I think. That's right. Right. So we have a little bit of follow-up and other small things. Yes. So we had, this was, I thought, a great tweet. And I I should look it up to to remind myself who tweeted this. So on, I think it was the last episode, I had a pet peeve where people talk about how they're submitting their IRB, <laughs> and it just drives me crazy. Yeah. And um, someone sort of made fun of me, which I thought, appropriately so, although I don't think this is quite as bad as that saying that you're submitting an IRB is really not that different than saying you're submitting a grant, right? Because a grant is money given to you. So you're not submitting money given to you. You're submitting correct. a proposal or a grant application. That, that is technically correct, yes. I, However, I would say that everyone says I'm submitting a grant. <laughs> like, everyone says that, right? So you're saying it's gotten to the point that it's, it's so pervasive in our just sort of day-to-day -day vernacular that it's now, like, legit. Yeah. Whereas submitting an IRB is not there yet. I don't feel like I hear that quite so often. I do hear it, though. Like, I hear, I often hear people say, I, oh, I need to do the IRB for that, <laughs> which is like, which is really sh short for saying, I need to submit the, you know, the proposal to the IRB for that grant or for that, or for that project. Yeah. But it hasn't gotten so pervasive yet that we think it's legit. Or you think it's legit. I guess not. I don't know. This is your pet peeve, not mine. <laughs> yes, but I mean, it sounds like you're aligned with me here. I think so, yeah, as we usually are. So here's the tweet. It was from Pat Schloss. Great episode. I about fell out of my chair at the end of this episode. You object to submit an IRB, but constantly talk about submitting a grant. <laughs> Unless you're the one giving people money, we submit grant proposal. Hashtag Pat's Pet Peeves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Pat could get his own podcast is all I'm saying. Or her. I don't I don't know there. Actually, I just got a <laughs> this. Uh, speaking of Pat Schlott, I think this is the same person, but apparently Pat also submitted <laughs> a grant under the same RFA that I did. What? Wait. Yeah. 
<laughs> the same Pat? I think so. That name sounds familiar. I because the um, the reason I know this is because I got a tweet uh, asking if I had heard anything. Because <laughs> the, the so the the council just reviewed everything, and I got this tweet from Pat Schloss that says, "Hey, have you heard anything about the R twenty five grid?" Oh wow! So anyway, apparently he didn't ask about whether you'd heard anything about the grant application. Oh, uh, excellent. No, just said, have you heard anything back on your R25? Oh, okay. Really should be R25 application, though. <laughs> All right. So I thought that was well played. Yes. But I do think I, I'm aligned with the, with the distinction you make between submitting an IRB and submitting a grant. <laughs> okay. Next, uh, I, have, I just wanted to make a very quick announcement. Okay. Which is that I have a new book out. It, it launched, actually launched before the last episode, but I forgot to mention it. So <laughs> here we are. <laughs> uh, but it's called Tidyverse Skills for Data Science in R. And it is a textbook about how to use the Tidyverse in R to analyze data. And uh, this one is written, it's written with Carrie Wright, Shannon Ellis, and Stephanie Hicks. Uh, so, and it's uh, available for free on LeanPub. Well, congratulations. Yes. And I will put the link in the show notes. Yeah, it's been doing pretty well. I just came up with the title. What's that? Well, we're obviously disorganized because you're now, you know, touting your book late. We're not sure about the pandemic episode number, right? We're struggling here. And so maybe the title needs to be about how hard maintaining organization is or being organized is. Okay. But you you can... You know, you have full authority to make any kind of final call. <laughs> You're going to get no disagreement from me about the, the <laughs> truthfulness of that title. Okay. It's accurate. It's quite accurate, yes. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Which reminds me, we, we didn't um, talk about my proposed commentary when we were doing our pre-record chat. So we have to come back to that at some point. <laughs> okay. This just really shouldn't be part of the podcast, but we're just like, now we're... <laughs> You're just like, <laughs> now we're just talking business now. Just, just you know, put a bookmark in that and... we Will do. All right, pet peeves. All you. This is not really a, it's, this is like a minor pet peeve. Because it's not, like some pet peeves are like fingernails going down a chalkboard, right? And some pet peeves are kind of like, well, that was sort of silly. And so this is more of like, that's sort of silly. So there was a, for a couple of weeks, I was sort of privy to or involved in like a whole slew of emails where someone was sending out sort of an ask, but they didn't clarify who specifically was tasked with what they were asking to be done. <laughs> okay. You know, like, cause in the two line, there were like a group of people, yeah. more than one person, right? Okay. We need to like finish up this document. Oh, uh, that's, that's a rookie move. Yeah. Then there was a whole, like, email cascade after that, like, oh, who did you want to do this? Yeah. And it's just it's just not good. It's poor leadership. <laughs> that reminds me, I got an email, like, a while back. That's kind of the point of the story, actually. A while back, that was, like, to a group of me and, like, a bunch of other people. And the person was like, I really want to organize a meeting for January so that we can talk about, you know, blah, 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 blah. And that was it. That was the email. <laughs> and I think the person thought that like everyone would email back, be like, oh, well, what about January this? And what about this time? I'm free this. You know, it's like, <laughs> and like it was radius silence. Wow. Um, and here we are, you know, almost the end of February. No meeting. And nothing. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how would you have, like, if you were, if you were the leader then, what would you have done? Well, <laughs> I mean, there's anything you, you could have done any number of things, right? Like you could have proposed some times, you could have sent out a doodle poll, anything that had an unambiguous like thing to respond to, I guess. Right, 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 right. Like I'm not saying people are gonna respond, <laughs> right? But like if there's nothing to respond to, then you're guaranteeing they're not gonna respond, right? Right, right. Yeah. That's sort of yeah, it's like sending an email and saying, Well, I was thinking this might be a good idea. <laughs> right. You have to be very direct and 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 the thing you're asking for needs to be a very 
defined and time limited requests, like filling out a deuter poll or saying yes or no, right. or raising your hand for something. Yes. Or, yeah. Actually, I will say that I'll, maybe I'll point this out. My good colleague and friend of the show, Jeff Leake, wrote a blog post like years ago. This must be about four or five years ago about how to send emails to busy people. Oh, I think I remember this. Yeah, I'll find it. I'll put a link in this. It's actually still relevant today, I think. Uh, getting Yes, getting email responses from busy people. Should we just quickly go through the six rules? Yes. Did you find it? Yes, I'm looking at it right now. Okay, perfect. It says, try to send no more than one email a day. <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. To that, to the recipient. To the like, recipient. He's not, he's not suggesting that you yourself only send one email a day in total. <laughs> like, actually, well, that, that that's maybe not bad advice either. <laughs> um, so that's number one. Number two, emails should be three sentences or less. Ooh. Better if you can get the whole email in the subject line. <laughs> Wow, I just broke that rule this morning. <laughs> yeah, I break that rule on a regular basis, I would say. If you need information, ask yes or no questions whenever possible. Never ask a question that requires a full sentence response. <laughs> I think that's right on the mark. Yeah. Number four, when something is time sensitive, state the action you will take if you do not get a response by the time you specify. That is so critical. I will, you know, I think... People who are, for example, being first authors of a paper or an abstract, and it's their first time around, that's a critically important piece of advice because they're trying to get feedback from co-authors. And I think sometimes they can feel, in, like I felt intimidated. Well, I don't want to tell all these senior people if I don't hear from you by Monday, February 22nd, it'll be submitted and we'll assume you, you know, you're good with it. Like I felt uncomfortable doing that as kind of an early career faculty person, but that's kind of a cultural norm and to be expected and nobody's offended by that. No, especially if it's a senior person who's only kind of tangentially involved. Right. Um, right. And uh, they'll be relieved to see that email. Yes. <laughs> Cause then it relieves them of the guilt of having to be like, have to having to respond. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Uh, all right, number five. There's two more. Number five, be as specific as you can while conforming to the length requirements. What's a length requirement? I'm not sure I understand. Maybe we'll have to get Jeff to follow up with that. That's right. Yes. Number six is a bonus. Include obvious keywords people can use to search for your email. Eh, I don't know about that one. but Yeah, I don't know about that one either. But I think it depends on your organizational style. So I think, you know, we had sort of a guest appearance from Paul Rathouse maybe like back in the spring or summer, or maybe it's it's been, oh, it was before the pandemic, I think. It's been a while. And he had all these organizational tips. And he's a stickler about, especially like subject lines to search on. Uh. Right. So um, I don't know that that some people may care about that. I... It, that that hurts my brain to sort of try to be that organized. <laughs> I find that like subject line searching is not that valuable because because if I can search on the if I can remember who sent the email, that's usually enough. Um, I, that's can be painful because if you have a lot of email dialogue with someone, and for me, and this is like a true confession, this will this you may find this disconcerting. Is I think you know this about me. A lot of times I use my email inbox as just a storage for stuff. Yes, I, yes. You do know that about me. And so if I'm like, oh, I think, you know, we had this discussion in email maybe sometime in 2019 in the fall, you know, I can search on you and maybe the, you know, some word that I think may be a key word, but... It still takes a bit of time. You know what I'm saying? Like yes. if it's if 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 the time period is either long or a, a long time ago and you have a lot of email correspondence with that person, there's still a lot to wade through. That's true. That's true. So was that six? Was that all six? That was it. Yep. All right. Maybe we can get clarification from Jeff for on that last point. <laughs> okay. Not well not the there was the the one before, uh the length requirements, yes. Right, right. But I do want to know whether he really, 
whether he himself puts keep practices what he preaches. I believe he does. Yes. All right. Yes. Well, it's interesting because I think at the time that the that this blog post was written, which was in 2011. <laughs> oh wow! I was way off. Yeah, he didn't. <laughs> He wasn't necessarily writing it from the perspective as like he's the busy person. Oh yes, he was. Tr- yeah, right, right, right. You know what I mean? Like whereas, like now he is the busy person. So a sign of great career advancement. Yeah. <laughs> so I put this in here, but I don't know whether you have anything to say about it. Any lessons Just, from space? Yes. Um, well, so you. <laughs> it's funny that you told you're telling me what my lessons from space are. Well, I'm not telling you what the lesson is from this. I'm just telling you what recent big event occurred. Yeah. So as of we're recording, yesterday was the landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars, which is a phenomenal you know, <laughs> feat of engineering, basically. There are two things that were amazing to me, and I don't know whether these relate to lessons or not. One is that it launched seven months ago. Yes. That's a lot of like patience and kind of sitting around. I mean, I guess they're checking on its trajectory and everything, but Yes, I mean, there is a team that has to monitor. It's like it's called the cruise stage. Um and so, yeah, there is a lot of waiting and uh and then it all kind of like unfolds in 7 minutes as it like lands. Wow. Um, and actually, if you, there is a, a, a Twitter account called NASA NASA P- Persevere. I'm following it now. Yeah, they've got some just amazing photos. I'm sure they'll have more. One nice thing about this landing is that they've got much higher resolution cameras than they did when the last rover landed, which is in 2003. So the only thing I would say is that, like, well, first, you mentioned how, like, there's like a long wait and, you know, and uh, there's a lot of like space, you know, kind of outer space missions that are like that. And I think um, the other thing that's interesting is like these people who built all this equipment, like all this, the landing, everything happened. It's like, you know, they, they'll never see it in action, right? <laughs> it's like, in a, in a way, it's like, it's just happening out there. And I was just thinking about yesterday how, like, you put all this, your work into this stuff and, like, and, you, and it's just like it's out there and it's you'll never see it again, you know? I don't know. I guess you just live with it, right? But, I guess, yeah. yeah. Um, It's just a weird, it just seems to, weird to me. They're probably used to it by now, but. I think the whole the whole thing is weird. Like, the getting... You know, having to plan so much ahead of time, and then you launch this thing. It, there's this intense, long period of work in the planning stage, and then there's this, as you said, called it, I guess, the cruise stage, and then there's the landing stage. But that you have, you must have to like plans, like like if I, I shouldn't say you, if I it, when I do analyze data. You know, I have a plan of of attack, but not down to the kind of detail that it's going to come off without a hitch, right? Because you learn things along the way. And and I know that that's not I know that's not the perfect analogy because you discover things, you know, with data, but it still like requires this mental sort of discipline and double checking and do you know what I'm saying? And and to be able to set up a gazillion steps ahead of time for such a massive project, and then you just hang out. For, I mean, I know they're not just hanging out, but you know what I mean, for seven months. It's funny you bring this up. I was thinking about this yesterday, right, um, about this idea that, like, I, I feel like the analogy that you just drew is not quite accurate. I feel like the, a better analogy is more like publishing a paper. Uh-huh. What, 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 if you think about what goes into publishing a paper, right, um, it's a huge amount of work. Even if you go back as far as like writing the grant proposal, they're not writing the grant, writing the grant proposal. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, getting the funding, uh, you know, setting up the study, collecting the data, you know, cause like, and, and, and then like, you know, getting the data, checking it, checking it twice, checking it three times, modifying the protocol, you know, you know, and, and then, like, you know, analyzing the data, checking this observation, you know, seeing if the form matches the data, you know, like all the stuff that you do that ultimately goes into, like, that published paper. I think that's the analogy, right? And then once that paper is, like, out there and published, like, then that's it. <laughs> I mean, more or less, right? <laughs> right, right, right. It's on its own out there, right? And I think that's kind of, like, I feel like that's what it feels like, I think, for me in terms of, like, how much effort... And, you know, and carefulness and checking and 
checking, you know, checking again and testing this and are we sure we're about this or what about this assumption? And, you know, um, I think that's kind of the analogy to like, you know, sending a rover out <laughs> to Mars. No. Yeah. I, th I think that, yeah, that is a better analogy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, an enormous amount of work. Yeah. The other thought that I had, and there's a lot of this chatter kind of in, in Texas about Texas and on Twitter, which is, you know, Texas is the space mecca. Is that fair to say in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, it's a pretty uh, central place for space. And it, it's also an energy mecca, believe it or not, in terms of... <laughs> ironically, like, yes. Yes, ironically. And people were pointing out that, like, you know, the budget that... And who knows whether this is just kind of metaphorical or not. And But the idea that, you know, the budget... They could have used the budget, a much smaller part of the budget for the Mars landing and like fixed this thing that's here on Earth in the state that's a physical problem that's known, you know, people know how to fix it. The weatherization of um, the electrical sources for the grid, um, you know, without a problem. So here we are in a state that, you know, has all of the capability of all the arduous work of planning and launching and then landing um, this, the, the Mars rover, the Perseverance, but yet, you know, has this colossal failure of infrastructure, you know, infrastructure that's based on kind of technology that exists in the state um, says something about kind of priorities. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, I feel like there's always a, I think there will always be people questioning like why we're spending money outside of this planet, right? I, I don't think. I, I guess I I didn't articulate that well. I, I don't think that they were suggesting that this that it was not a good investment. You know, the, in terms of the the space aspects, it's more that if we can, you know, pull this thing off, like why can't we even deal with something that is, you know one-tenth as complicated and as costly. Well, I think that depends on what you what you think of as complicated, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> I mean, something like a Mars rover is certainly an engineering challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the political challenge was largely dealt with long, a long time ago. I mean, sure, there's always politics to a certain extent, right? Um, but... In terms of like the weatherization of the ener of the energy infrastructure, that's more than an engineering challenge. I mean, the engineering challenge is just one bit, right, of the problem. I think so. It's I mean, say the same thing about like how come we don't have a cure for cancer, but we can land on the moon, right? Those are totally different. I mean, different definitions of difficult, right? Right. F fair enough. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say is that I feel like a lot of times it's like if we have a number one priority and a number two priority. Then like it's like, well, why are we spending money on the number two priority when we have a number one priority, right? And it's like, well, you got to spend money on all the priorities in some sense, right? Um, but otherwise, <laughs> there's no point in even saying what the number two priority is, right? So, any other lessons from the the <laughs> Mars landing? There's going to be like some just really amazing video and photo photography in the coming days, so just look out for it. I think. And if I'm following that Twitter account, I should see it. I think you should, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Main topics? Let's do it. We're right on schedule. This episode is right on schedule. This, no, just saying, like, you know, we're very disorganized, but we're also right on schedule. Disorganized and organized at the same time. Yes. So one of our main topics is academic EQ. I don't know. You've heard that term EQ, right? Like, it's the emotional quotient instead of, like, the intelligence quotient. Yes, um, and I think I'm sure we've touched on this in multiple episodes and I'm not sure I made this outline like before I went on my vacation, which, you know, that vacation was then followed by this awful week in Texas. And so I can't even remember like what prompted me to, to think about this as a main topic, but I, I think I've just observed over time that there are some people who are so good at navigating I think not just sort of professional relationships, but sort of the weirdness of organizational structure in academia. Um, 
And and some of this is, you know, kind of just professional relationship EQ. But I think there's some distinct aspects of kind of academic environments in terms of like one example is like, how do you ask for stuff? And how you ask for stuff in another setting, I think, is different than how you might ask for stuff in an academic setting. Yeah. Um, I think, and you may disagree with this, is that academia, you know, I think it it draws people or is attractive to people who um, are used to being in systems where there's um, kind of positive feedback. And along with that come a bunch of rejections, right? Like getting a grant or getting a paper published or um, so on and so forth. And so I think there's a skill in academia that I think I underappreciated, which is like, how do you make sure that your mentees and your collaborators or other people you're interacting with feel really good about whatever, you know, contribution that they've made at the end of the day or at the end of the meeting and and how powerful that skill is. Like I've been in meetings with someone who's so good at when someone says something, their instinct is to say, I 100% agree with blah, 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 you know, whatever it was that they said. Their immediate response and their first response is what it is that they agree with that that person said, even if there's something that they disagree with. Um, and so that's, I think, a very effective skill. Um, and the third one is the time horizons. I mean, there's short, shorter ones that are important in academia, but a lot of times the time horizon is really about the long game. And I think that takes a sort of special set of academic EQ skills. And then the fourth one we touched on already, this is working out really well, was about um, kind of email in academia and like how to send one yes anyway i threw a bunch of stuff out there not sure that you're that it, that it made sense um what's your, i guess uh you don't even you don't even know what to do with all that do you no i my question for you is this are you ready yeah do you think having like so what you I, i'm guessing everything you just described is like a good academic, or is it? It's a score, right? Is it? Do they score it like IQ? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's so a like high, a high academic. academic EQ, right? Yeah. That is what you just described, right? Right. Do you think? <laughs> now, here's my question for you: Do you think that is a predictor of like success in academia? Um. Yes. Really. Mm-hmm. I think. Uh, well, let me back up. I think it depends on what the person's goals are. So I think if your goals, so this should be carefully couched. So if you're really good at grant writing and, and running your own research program and you, that goal is, can be more effectively realized by having high EQ, but having high EQ is not, necessary to succeed if that's your goal. If your goal is to um, be recognized at your institution or within a professional society or something like that, or have a leadership type of role, particularly like in a net network, like a research network or within your institution, um, I don't think you can be successful without having these as successful without these skills, the people who have these skills, I think, you know, I I've been amazed watching some people with these skills and they're so good at it that, um, people want to reach out to them for advice. People feel good about themselves when they reach out for them advice. They're people who kind of are effective at getting resources and helping people out. And, um, that makes for someone who has kind of results to show for their work, you know, that typically makes leadership happy and then also makes them, you know, well respected among their colleagues. Hmm. You, you disagree with this. 
well, I disagree in a specific way. I think the okay. correlation between like EQ and that kind, the success that you describe is is like near is closer to, is close to zero. I would say. Wow. And by and I I don't mean it's negative, right? And I don't mean so I don't mean, but I also don't mean it's positive. What I mean is that like there's just as many people with low EQ low EQ who are successful as there are with high EQ. Oh, I see what. That's yeah. been, that's been my experience. Like for every person with like a super high EQ who's like successful that you can find, I can. I don't know if this is the right analysis to do. I'm looking. I'm thinking of my two by two table here. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, I just feel like it's not a strong predictor, in my opinion. Yeah. Like if you come across someone who's got like a who you think has like a low EQ, and then I ask you, is this person really successful in their institution? Like, do you think you'll be able to predict that? Maybe, well, I guess, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say across the population. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'll take your point that I don't think it's like this, you know, super strong predictor. But yeah. I guess what I would say is... I do think that things are changing, though. Okay. Yeah. So I think maybe in the, maybe it'll it's becoming more important, I would say. I would hope so. Right. I think that maybe another way to think about this, not just in terms of like how much of a predictor is, is that I maybe tell me whether you agree with this or not, which is that cultivating these skills will is guaranteed to be helpful. Yeah. I, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I'm not sure everyone that, that I've known would agree, but I do. Oh, oh some people you think would not agree that, Cultivating these skills would definitely be helpful. Yes. <laughs> wow. And why? Like, tell me more. I mean, you've come across people like this, haven't you? I mean, who are on the opposite end of the spectrum? I think it again. I think maybe the people who say that are like, well, I have a research program and I'm successful writing grants, and so I don't need to cultivate these things. I think that's a different argument than, you know, do you think that you would have gotten been able to do things maybe you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do because of kind of supported resources that you were able to um, garner. I think it's hard. Well, this is a tricky issue to navigate because like you're talking about like people in leadership positions, right? Right. <laughs> and like there's only so many people in leadership positions, yes. even at a large university. So um, I don't want to pick anyone in particular out, uh, but um yeah, I I do agree that I don't think it, I think it it definitely uniformly helps to you know have these kinds of skills. Do you do you think about these skills or not really? I do. Yeah, I do think about them. I do um, wish that I I you know I would kind of could be better at cer certain of these things. Um, but on the other hand, it's not immediately clear to me that I want the thing that you're talking about. Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> In terms of like what it might like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get the thing that the, these skills will help me get. <laughs> but I don't think that the skills are bad. <laughs> They're bad. Got it. You're not aspiring to be like a dean or department chair or something like that. Is that what you're trying to say? I mean, if you have to put a a fine point a title, on it. yeah, yes. Well, you are good. I think one of the other things is is that if you come up through kind of PhD training, a big part of what you do in many is classroom teaching. And if you're an MD, kind of teaching is kind of you're in clinic and there may be medical students or residents rotating or you're mentoring someone who's doing a fellowship and part of that fellowship is a research project. And You've not had any formal training in teaching. And I get the sense, you know, from my PhD colleagues are so good when I've been in kind of meetings with a trainee with them at, um, it's not articulated well enough just to, to say, oh, being positive. It's not so much of that. Like they meet the person where they are. And and that helps make that person feel good about where they are and, and at the same time kind of inspire them, you know, to to for towards growth and to make progress. And um 
that skill, I, I mean, I described it very specifically in a teaching situation, but I think that that transfers to, you know, discussions with colleagues or what have you. Yeah. I mean, I do think that like, and we've talked about how like a lot of collaboration is involves in a, some kind of sense of teaching, right? You're teaching people. And I think it could be that those of us who are constantly in that position, whether in the classroom or whatever, you know, just have an opportunity to practice those skills a little bit more <laughs> than others. Right, right. Is there like an assessment for, I guess, ac academic EQ is a little bit like narrow, but is there like an EQ assessment? I have no idea. Okay. And, and the other thing that I think that's hard about EQ is I think, I think it's, you would have to be assessed by other people, I think. I see. I mean, I'm just speculating. Maybe there are people who are listeners who have more expertise in this, right? Like, Well, they're, they're, they could only have more expertise than us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yes, yes. But I, I mean, it, it doesn't strike me that I, like, I don't think I have a good sense of my own EQ. Like, it would not be as accurate as other people's sense of my own EQ. I see. Yeah, it's like not something that you could self-calculate uh, or whatever. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Okay. All right. Should we move on to the next item? Yeah. Our medical school is the research area of the medical school is thinking about or just sort of discussing like, okay, you know, people have used the H index for kind of some sort of metric about impact of research and the H index is very limited. You know, are there other alternative indices that are out there. Um, and this is just one part of kind of a larger discussion. There's not really a discussion to sort of pick one one metric to work with. To, to um, measure your worth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Tie it directly to dollar signs. No, I'm kidding. Um, and, 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 you know, the interesting thing is the medical school is interested in thinking about this issue broadly just because... Um, part of the medical school's kind of positioning and vision is that it really wants to be the driver of improved health for the Austin community. And that can be done in many, many different ways, but something like an H index is, is not going to capture that dimension of what the medical school wants to do. And I'm not suggesting that these other alternative metrics that we're going to talk about would accomplish that either. It's just that these two things have come up in discussion and there were metrics that I was not familiar with. So I thought it was worth mentioning um, on the effort report. And so two that came up in our committee's discussion were eyesight and alt metric. Neither of which I've heard of. Which to me is fascinating, you know, because we had that one episode, right? Where we had a battle of metrics. We, that's right. The metrics. Uh, <laughs> the metrics bowl. Bowl, bowl them... yes, yes. Um, and I don't think we had these on here. No, I'm not sure they necessarily existed. That was like years ago. Right, right. So, so eyesight comes from NIH. You pointed this out. I'm I'm on the website. Can I, can I read the first? Yeah, the you're here? you're allowed to do it because I know you'll have you'll you'll have, take a lot of joy in doing this. Well, okay. It says here. I just Googled eyesight, I-C-I-T-E. It says, eyesight is a tool to access a dashboard of bibliometrics for papers associated with a portfolio. What <laughs> does that even mean? Like, I don't know. There's like half the words in that sentence. I don't think I know, understand what they mean. <laughs> well, no, I think you understand what each of them means. We don't understand in this context what they mean together. I Maybe, that, yeah, I guess so. I know what I a mean, dashboard is. Right. <laughs> People ask me to make them all the time. Right. Because that's what you do as a biostatistician. That's what biostatisticians do, yeah. So it says, eyesight has three modules, influence, translation, and open citations. Influence provides relative citation ratio values, whatever that is. Right. Which measure the scientific influence of each paper by field and time adjusting the citations it has received and benchmarking to the median for <laughs> NIH publications, the value of which is set at one. So the concept here, let me try to translate what the please, intent is. Please, is dude. that the H index, the 
so, among many criticisms, some of the criticisms are, you know, the longer that you're around, the higher your H index is. And so um, people earlier on in their careers are sort of, you know, punished yeah. by, yeah, penalized. And then fields have different, right? If you're in the small field, um, then you're going to be penalized as well. And so this, these adjustment for field and time, which I don't know how they do it. Um, and then they benchmark to the median NIH publications that are, I think, for someone in the field who's been publishing for a certain amount of time gives sort of this relative citation ratio. And so unlike your H index, which can increase over time, your eyesight um, can move up and down. That's not good. You're not a fan. Well, if, it's, if it can go down. Then... <laughs> it's it's got to be bad. <laughs> and then there's like this translation measure, which I guess in NIH parlance, translation means like animal to human, I think. Uh, no, it can also mean like human to community or... Is that what that... Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know what it, so here it says the translation measures how human, animal, or molecular, cellular, biology oriented each paper is and uses this information to track and predict citation by clinical articles. I think they mean that like if you're doing animal studies, that's low. And if you're doing like human studies, that's high. And so they have an APT. Oh, look at this. An approximate potential to translate. There you go. So it's how translatable, how close approximate the work you're doing is to translations to human, right? Then it's a machine learning based estimate of the likelihood that a paper will be cited in later clinical trials or slash guidelines. Well, I feel better already. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's machine learning involved. I mean, <laughs> all right. I think we've had enough of eyesight. Okay. Should we move on? To... So I actually I know, don't, don't know what the other one was at all. I thought you didn't know what um, eyesight was. I didn't know either one, obviously, yeah. <laughs> so Altmetric, anyway, I'm on their website too, so I'll read their blurb. It's a single uh, research, uh, wait, hold on. At Altmetric, we work behind the scenes collecting and collating all of the disparate information about your publication. So what they're saying is, is that the work you do could be online in multiple platforms and websites and talked about across all these platforms. And so Altmetric um, includes kind of media engagements and tweets and so on and so forth. And so, yes. you know, can a I, single... Can I just say that I love how they say that they work behind the scenes? <laughs> <laughs> like, what scene? Like, what? <laughs> I don't, I don't... Sorry, that just made me it just made me crack up. No, yes, yes. Um, and so I actually installed their like for I think that there's a way to get like research researcher altmetric numbers, but they have a free kind of I don't know if they're called widgets still that you know stick in your toolbar where if you click on like a paper or something and then you click on this altmetric it. Oh, okay, yeah. Bookmark then you get this altmetric number and it sort of parses out like, you know, you may have a score of 45 and then it'll break down like what part of that score is from activity on Twitter and what part is from, um, you know, citations in other journals, what part is from appearances in national media and so on and so forth. And so the idea is the concept behind altmetric is that the impact of, of, any unit of work is be it goes beyond sort of just the realm of the scientific literature and what matters is like whether other people are talking about it you know in these other platforms whether they be on social media platforms or actually in um you know traditional media platforms you know, like newspapers or tv or radio okay I don't really have anything else to say about Altmetric, but it's if you're bored, it, it could be entertaining too. You can go and like go into go your Google Scholar page and pull out one of your papers. And then if you 
install the alt metric, it, it turns out it's a bookmark. And you click on that bookmark, you can kind of check out the alt metric for it. Okay. Maybe maybe we can report back next time. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. Anything else on uh, metrics to evaluate your worthiness? <laughs> wow. <laughs> You're harsh today. <laughs> No, I have nothing. I have nothing else on that note. Okay, last topic. Last topic. This is yours. I wanted to have a discussion about the future. Oh, the future of academia. That is. Mm -hmm. So once the pandemic ends, as surely it will, right? Yes. Um, I feel like so. I think there's going to be a general discussion of like, what have we done during the pandemic that we can take into into the future to help us improve academia, right? Whether it's like using Zoom <laughs> for faculty meetings or whatever, right? I mean, there's going to be, or teaching classes online or whatever, you know, every university is going to have some version probably of this conversation. Um, and one question I had was whether you think it would affect where faculty I guess for lack of a better word, live um, relative to like their institution's geography, right? And let me just kind of set some little context here. Yeah. So I mean, if you think about like the current situation, or when I say current situation, I mean the situation before COVID, right? Um, there's already been, I mean, there's already many examples of people who live like, you know, far from an institution right everything like for example you know johns hopkins is in baltimore there are certainly faculty who live in washington dc uh philadelphia you know whatever right that's that's a 45 to an hour and a half drive away um there's people who live like there was <laughs> one faculty member in my department actually a long time ago lived across the street actually <laughs> so that's the other extreme maybe um and uh when I was at UCLA, I was a graduate student there. There was a faculty member who lived in New York City um, and fly, would fly to Los Angeles, teach his classes, meet with people, mm -hmm. and then fly back. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, you know, it's so, you know, already even before this, co you know, having this conversation, there's people who have all different kinds of arrangements, right? Right. But right. typically, I'd say when we recruit, when we recruit people into our department, um, there's a general assumption that they will move to the general area, to the metropolitan area, right? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not Baltimore, but somewhere around here, right? And uh, I wonder how valid that assumption will be in the future. That's what I'm asking. Oh. Um, and whether we should change the assumption, I guess. Right, right, right. So I, I've, I guess a few observations. One, I actually think that and I don't know whether this is because I, this could be completely confounded by the fact that I've just got a more senior in my career now. But over time, I've seen more and more examples of, um, and a lot of times what sets, sets up the circumstances for this are couples, um, where it's just hard to find two senior level jobs, right? And so one may be, they may be living together in the same city, but one may be commuting by plane, you know, three days a week or something like that. So they work out a deal where they're present part of the week, um, but not the full, not, they're not physically present for the full work week. Um, and I think that that seemed to be increasing to me. But again, I don't know whether that was just because these were kind of higher level jobs and also not clinically intensive jobs. So I think that we have to put an asterisk by, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by clinical jobs. So I, I guess what I'm asking is what if we just c cut out the commuting part, right? So, Like if everything went remote. So you're saying this person flies three days a week or flies in, stays for three days, and then flies out, right? Yeah. What about, so what if we just got rid of that part? Right, right. Yeah. I think that there's going to be an expectation that that, that – some at like there, there's going to have to be some physical presence for something like Still, I don't think, think I, I think so, because I think, um, well, first of all, there's even for people in academic medicine that don't have, you know, maybe they do something where they're like an inpatient attending, but don't have any recurrent outpatient 
presence. And so they could just fly in and do their inpatient work for, you know, a two week stint or something and then do the rest remote. I think there, there is a greater appreciation for, I think two things have happened that may seem paradoxical. One, there's a greater appreciation for how much can be done remotely, while there's also a greater appreciation for the importance of in-person interactions for some activities. And this is all, you know, based on the fact that I talk to people of my same age who have kids who are college age, like my son really wanted in-person school. Yeah. He did, he did not like, you know, yeah. a virtual school. And I think that universities are, um, when it's, you know, deemed safe for everyone to come back, I think that it's going to be important to them that there's in-person school. And so because of that, you know, people are going to require to have some sort of presence on campus. All at the same time saying that I could imagine a scenario that if someone's teaching one semester but not the next, they may not be on campus the next semester. And there are examples of that where, you know, people do work in international sites. Like I know of faculty who live in India for a good part of the year, you know, and come back for the semester when they teach. Um so I think it's going to be a mixed bag. I think I gave a rambling answer. Well, there's a difference between kind of like what the reality is and uh-huh. what the expectations are. Like, and yeah. I think for sure, like obviously there's a huge amount of heterogeneity in the expectations because, for example, like you said, if you work in like international health or something like that, <laughs> there's an expectation that like most of the faculty are not going to be there, <laughs> right, right? right? They're going to be international, right? Um, and so it's... Uh, I think that's like a very different type of setting. And, and obviously, if you're expected to see patients, then there is kind of an expectation that like you'll be there to see the patients. Um, but I, so I guess my question is really whether the expectations will change as opposed to reality. Um, because the reality might be very similar in some ways, but for at least in the short term, I should say. Um, but if the expectations change, then over the long term, you know, departments could look very different over time, I think. There was, I saw an email somewhere and I can't remember, maybe it came, I don't want to say where I saw it come from because I can't remember which institution, but it was a clear statement that faculty come fall of 2021 were expected to be in residence. Okay. So there's two questions I have. Well, let me get to the uh, one question I have is what do you think that means? And um, the other, the, the other question is really more of a background was like, do you like, there's a question of like whether you're on campus and whether you live nearby and with the generous definition of the word nearby. Okay. Um, like, cause you can in principle be on campus, right. At any time. <laughs> right. If you can make it there. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't require you to live nearby. Uh, but right. whether, but there does seem to be an expectation in my experience that you do kind of live nearby. Right. 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 And that's just maybe that's just like, what's the word? Um, you know, inherited from, you know, the past. What would your, if you were a university, what, like, do you think that there are going to be policies that, co- I mean, I can't imagine them, like, I think the only kinds of things that they could really enforce are that, you know, they could enforce that you are a- available in person for certain activities that you're required to do. Well, I think that, that could be, you know, I think the question, the issue is that I don't think universities really have a principle to kind of like base any of this on because it's never had to be, well, maybe some departments do, but I know ours, ours does it. And like, if the, I think if this becomes a thing for like every department in the university, like, uh, like we don't have an, or like a principle around which really to kind of make a decision. So if I said to you, is it okay with you guys if I live in Austin I'll be there in the fall semester, you know, Tuesday through Thursday to teach my whatever class. Well, I mean, we already have people like that who live in like, you know, Washington, D.C., right? Right, And right. frankly, it is a pain in the neck to drive up here from Washington, even though it's right, only like right, an hour away, right? right? Uh, so you're trying to make a distinction between Washington, D.C. and Austin, Texas. I guess that's what it comes down to, because we've already accepted the fact that people live in like, I don't know, Philadelphia or Washington, right? That's the, that's water under the bridge, right? So now it's like, what if I live in California or what if I live in Texas? 
or what if I live in, you know, <laughs> Beijing or whatever, right? So. Right, right. Seems like it would be hard for them to like. I mean, you're, there's a dis- d- difference, as I as you're saying, between a policy or a principle. But it would be hard to say as long as you could fulfill the duties of your job. And they could make requirements that your job duties include, you know, certain in-person activities. And like for clinical thing, you have to, you may need to be in person within a certain distance or be able to get to the hospital within a certain amount of time. That's not uncommon for certain types of clinical jobs, uh, period. And then, of course, clinical jobs in academic medical centers. So that to me would be the way that they would come at it. And I think it would be hard for someone who had teaching, didn't have those sorts of clinical expectations for them to say, well, you can live in D.C., but you can't live in Austin. Yeah. And I think you're right in that. I think no, I don't think any, I think most universities will not allow like you to just like teach your class remotely like you're teaching it right now. Um, I think they will revert back to the old way. Right. For the, for the well, most part, I think. Right. Right. Yeah. I think so too. Um, that said, so my final question is what would be your pref? Like if you were the person in charge, right? What would be your preference for like a policy or a principle along these lines? Yeah, I think that's a tough one. I think practically speaking, you would want to make, you would want to set up, like I've been talking about here, the expectations of, like, if if you're going to hire someone, this is the expectations of what they do in person. And I think it has to be tied to activities like office hours for students or what the clinical responsibilities are, what the teaching responsibilities are. Um, I can imagine it could get even more kind of complicated or nuanced than that, because like, can you be the president of a university who doesn't do any teaching or clinical work and do that all remotely? No. Right. So there may be. Okay. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I mean, I'm like, here's my question. If I had like a jet at my disposal, Uh (laughs) right? I don't know. And, And it was a jet that didn't produce any like carbon signature. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so I can fly around the world no matter what. And just... Should I start calling you Elon Musk? <laughs> well, I don't think he has a jet like that. <laughs> but <laughs> suppose I did, right? And I just fly in and out whenever I'm needed, right? Is that okay? Right, right. So this is this is where I was going to draw the line. And I, don't, I have no idea how to grapple with this. But um, universities have really important relationships with the communities in which they exist. Um, And and I think this is particularly true, like the higher up in the hierarchy, like an individual faculty member, you know, or leader is, which is that there's something to be said that, you know, the dean of the medical school lives 365 days a year in Austin because the medical school has an obligation to the community and it's important that their leaders be members of the community Um, and how that gets articulated, you know, in some sort of job offer or, you know, policies, I think becomes a complicated issue, but if, and, and it may be different for, you know, public versus private institutions. Um, You know, there's, you know, UT is huge. They're like 50,000 students. I think the entire community of students, staff, and faculty may be almost 100,000. Yeah. And so there's this very, you know, intricate, intimate relationship between the university and the community and city government. Um, and you might say, well, does that matter at the individual level? And And I think at some point, it does matter for individuals who have certain leadership positions that they understand the community and live in the community and know what the different neighborhoods are and have a you know face in the community and so on and so forth. But I'm not sure like how it would be interesting. I have a good friend who's sort of an HR lawyer and it would be interesting to hear her thoughts about like legally, you know, how that could be circum kind of, articulated and, and required or expected for certain types of jobs. And it's, does that make any sense? Yeah, no, it does. I think that's like the only real 
principle really <laughs> that you could uh, organize this around. I mean, I think the idea that like, because otherwise it's like, if it's just about the job, I mean, it depends, or you could just redefine the job. Like if you redefine the job as like, you need to somehow contribute to the community or something like that. Right. Then, uh, I mean, maybe you could do that remotely too. I mean, who knows? Right. But <laughs> right, um, right. there's like an intangible element here. That's a little hard. That's just, this is my, this is the thing I'm trying to get to. It's like, it's a little hard to articulate. I think with great specificity, what it is that you miss when the person is not here. And who's you? And you have to decide who you is. Yeah, I agree. You do have to decide who the pers- who the audience is. Right, right. Um, and uh, so it's not a tr- it's not an easy issue. I-, I think there are companies that deal with this all the time. Like you know that there are companies that mandate that you have to live in certain places or whatever. Right, and I don't know how they do right. it, but um, but uh, I-, I think I don't know. I feel like it'll be interesting going forward to see how. Because I think those issues, like you said, they're more clear at the leadership level, but I think they become a little bit more gray at like the kind of -of run-of-the-mill professor level. Right, Um, right. So it'll it'll be interesting, for I think, for me to see how it plays out. Would you ever, this is like so hypothetical, but do you think that you would like contemplate (laughs) having a job someplace that was flying distance, right? Like not D.C. to Baltimore, but living, I don't know, like working in Baltimore, but living in... Chicago. You, <laughs> the, I mean, I'm not. I'm not talking about Chicago, like it's the real city where you would want. You know, I'm just saying as an example of distance. Yeah, I, to, to me that kind of goes against like what I this personally like what I think of as the job. Like I do think that like I think for me the job is better when other people are around. And that's just being selfish, right? Right. Um. So I feel like. But because I believe that, then you know, the, on the other on the other side of things, that that to me to kind of hold to that principle, I should be around too, right? Right. But right. you know, it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's an interesting question. I think maybe a year from now there'll be some clarity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Weekly grind. Weekly grind. Um, I was supposed to work on my grant proposal. Even I was like. Proposal. Thank you. Even though I was holed up in this hotel and had intermittent power, I just, my brain wouldn't function. I couldn't bring myself to do it. So it's sort of like a not, what did I not do? It's, I, I'm, it's, it's unbelievable. I can't believe you didn't a, work on your grant. It's, it's a weekly ungrind. <laughs> um, let me tell you what I did this week. Okay. It was my turn to fill out the NSF Grant proposal conflict of interest spreadsheet. <laughs> oh no, this thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm on an NSF grant. Yay. Did you use Lucy's? Um... You know what's funny? Um, I did not because the our grant administrative like person who handles the paperwork, she emailed me. She's like, hey, there's like an app <laughs> that someone developed in the oncology department. Um, that like for exactly this purpose, and it's like a shiny app. So you like it's like you, know, you go to the website and you just type in your name, and it just pulls PubMed and all your co-authors and everything, and it just like produces an Excel spreadsheet. Wow! So I yeah I was like I was gonna I was gonna email Lucy and be like where's your software, but like I just use this app. So it wasn't that painful in the end. It it was still painful because <laughs> you could you know it's only in the last whatever 48 months or something like that i can't remember so you have to filter out people that are anyway uh-huh. it's it's ridiculous anyway i'm sorry <laughs> my t- my time was i was due basically so yeah yeah well and you had an app so yeah it could have been a lot worse yeah so i think that that's a wrap mm-hmm. we are on twitter you can find us um at the effort at the effort report I guess I should say you should you can find us at at the effort report. Is that right? Since we're being pedantic in this episode. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And our email address is the effort report at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>